So another topic that was raised, um, somebody mentioned in my comments, uh, I, it's very interesting to hear uh, the, the, the evidence that they use. So one, one another, another example is the Council of Constance. And is it true, Father, that not every decree from that council was approved? Or, and aren't, so people would say, look, that's an example of the church for you know teaching heresy and yet you know the the church church is still holy uh, and the r and r position is look the church is always infallible the pope is infallible when he's speaking ex cathedra look so you can have it you can have situations where condemned de decrees and doctrines are happening in council so therefore vatican II, whatever problems there are with the documents that were issued from vatican II, it's just like the council of constance so nothing is really different Sure. Uh, the Council of Constance is very interesting to consider from, an, from a, a, a variety, according to a variety of aspects. Uh, for one thing, it did, in fact, bring about the, the resolution of the Great Western Schism uh, for all of its problems. It, it was successful in that way. Everybody who was involved in it was successful to that extent. The Great Western Schism, whatever side anybody had been on previously to whichever papal claimant he had adhered to prior, to the Council of Constance, everybody agreed after that who the true Pope was. There was no question. It was Pope Martin V. But actually, that gets into some interesting points as well. The very fact that the Council, going about the election of a new Pope in the way it did, st still managed to produce a, a, a valid Pope. That is another interesting point. But yes, to, to keep ourselves focused on the question of the fact that certain documents of the Council of Constance were incorrect. That is true. And uh, the reason why the indefectibility of the church was not in any, way, in any way harmed by that fact is really simply because the the problematic documents were never approved. Uh, <laughs> that uh, the church never actually gave her stamp of approval to those documents. They may have been presented to the council. They may have been voted on by the council. But ultimately, the pope is everything in the Catholic church. Everything. Uh, an entire council, to take an extreme example, an entire council could be in total opposition to the definition of some teaching. And the Pope could say, no, we're defining it, and you're defining it with me, and that's that. And that happens, and that's it. It's done. The Pope possessing the plenitude of jurisdiction in the church is the final say. There is no higher appeal. Not to any, not to a future Pope, not to a future council, not to a future Pope and council together not to anything else is there any appeal beyond the pope and conversely entire, an entire council could be in favor of defining something the pope could say nope not doing it that's it it's not defined mm. that doesn't necessarily mean it's false so the pope doesn't want to define it but an entire council could be in favor of its definition and the pope could say no and his say is final he has everything uh there are, have been in the history of the church different ways of explaining how exactly uh, definitions work, but it seems that the correct explanation is that the Pope, and when, whenever a council, the members, the bishops assembled in council define together with the Pope, they're able to do that because, in a sense, he hooks them up to his infallibility generator, so to speak. <laughs> and if they're not hooked up to that, if he doesn't allow them to be hooked up to that, they're not, and that's that. There's nothing they can do. Conversely, yeah, he can define completely by himself as the definition of an ex cathedra definition is one a definition of matters of faith or morals put out by the pope completely on his own as the vicar of christ on earth not engaging anybody else he's not allowing anybody else to define with him he's defining completely on his own as the vicar of christ on earth he defines that's infallible really the pope is everything and this is might might be difficult might, or it might be uh, in some way repulsive to some people today given what the recognize and resist position does for reverence to the papacy in people's souls, uh, what it does to reverence for the hierarchy of the church, what it really does for uh, correct understanding of the nature of the church, what it really does to the virtue of faith, period, to the souls of those who adhere to it. Uh, the recognize and resist position does that. This might come across as strange or repulsive to people who are infected with that position or have never been well instructed as a result of it. But it's all absolutely true. Uh, the Pope is everything. <laughs> he is everything. 
uh, nothing gets past him. Uh, no, nothing that he refuses approval to is approved. Um, anything that he approves is approved. Anything he defines is defined. Nothing that he doesn't want to define is defined. Uh, and that's it. He is the vicar of Christ on earth. He holds, and that means he holds the place of Christ on earth. Well, uh, that's so, fairly clear, I think. <laughs> yes. Uh, you've laid so, that up. Applying that to the Council of Constance, uh, yes, there were certain documents that in the Council of Constance, which taught essentially that a pope that is subject to a, an ecumenical council, a general council of the church, that a pope can be called to task by an ecumenical council. And the reason for the popularity of that idea to begin with was exactly the great Western schism that the council was trying to resolve, that you had all these papal claimants, none of whom were willing to give up the, their claim to the papacy for the sake of the good of the church. Uh, they, would all, they would all say it, or some of them would say it. Oh, yes, yeah, so I, I would resign the papacy if I could see that this would do good to the church. But when it actually came down to it, they would refuse. And so just out of frustration, we need to resolve this. Yeah, everybody, all the Catholic nations of Western Europe could all see clearly that the Great Western Schism was a catastrophe. <laughs> this is a disaster. This is a nightmare situation. We have to resolve this. And so some people got the idea, well, maybe, what if we could resolve this by calling a council and calling to test all these claimants, whether true popes or not, or there can only be one true pope anyway. But what if we could call a council that could hold all of them, bring all of them to task? and require all of them to do whatever, even the one who is the true Pope. A council, what if we could call a council that could require these claimants to do a council's bidding? Uh, maybe we could force a resolution that way. And the Council of Constance, to, to that, as a result of that, that mentality, this idea of conciliarism arose. And many times, yes, we talk about the, the adjective conciliar is used to refer to the, the, the sort of religion to the, the term the conciliar church is used one which i personally never use except to explain the the use of it in context like this certainly one that priests in our circles don't use at least not not usually because of the way that lefevre use it archbishop lefevre himself used the term and lefevre in general continue to use it which is uh to say that there is that the Vatican II gave birth to a new church, the conciliar church, and the Pope is the head of both the Catholic Church and the conciliar church at the same time, which is, I mean, the, that that system tries to, to change the church and turn the church into a monster with one head and two bodies. Uh, so <laughs> we don't use that term because we don't want to uh, ever to be seen to adhere to such a caricature of the church. But conciliarism as understood before Vatican II, the term was around before Vatican II ever occurred. The, to talk about conciliarism is to talk about this idea that the Catholic Church, a council, a general council of the Catholic Church could is higher than the Pope, and the Pope has to do the bidding of that council. And that is false. Some of the, but it, that doctrine, that false doctrine of conciliarism made its way into certain documents of the Council of Constance. But those documents were never approved. And that was clear to everybody at the time, because very famously in the, the conclusion of the council, Pope Martin V, who was the Pope elected by the council, everybody agreed by the end of the council that he was the true Pope, Pope Martin V. Uh, he approved all of the documents, which in Latin had been uh, provided concilialiter. They had been voted upon concilialiter. And it's, there's been some debate as to what exactly that term means. Some have taken it to mean that, oh, that, that means the, the documents which the council provided in the way that a council should. You know, this is it's a somewhat odd verb. It was a manufactured adverb, councilly. <laughs> that, that would be the English equivalent. Take the word council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, and just tack L-Y to the end of it, councilly. Yeah, what does that mean exactly? Uh, uh, some have taken it to mean, okay, done in the manner that a council should do. In other words, everything in a, actually in accordance with the Catholic faith. That's one way it's been taken. That's probably not the correct explanation. What it seems to mean, what I actually refer to is the, the, the methods of voting in the council. So some documents were voted on bishops voting uh, in national blocks. Uh, say they, they voted. So the bishops from France, the bishops from Spain voted, a, voted yes or no uh, on these different documents. Uh, the way in which the 
all of the good documents of the council were voted upon, which Pope Martin V actually approved, were those which were voted upon by all the members of the council together, conciliariter, uh, in, in a, uh, as members of a council, not members of any national bloc. And so the ones that, that were unacceptable had been voted upon uh, by the members of the council, by those participating in it as national blocks. So anything voted upon by national bloc, forget about all of that. I mean, the Pope can do that. He can choose the documents he wants to approve and the ones he doesn't want to approve. And he chose the ones that had been voted upon by the council as a whole. And so that clearly excluded any, any possibility of the approval of the, the false doctrine known as conciliarism. Hmm. So, so and that's a, uh, we need a bit of, that was true. That was a bit detailed, but we need some background information. To no, no, it's, it's very important. Um, I think the, the, the idea was, was, was the, the, the false doctrine, the idea that an ecumenical council is superior yes. to a pope? That's the main thing, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that, that never that passed. That is the false doctrine of conciliarism. That, never. It never passed. Okay. It, it, and it's funny because if you go to Wikipedia, it says the Council of Constance is a Issued two significant decrees, Hake Sancta, uh, 1415, which asserted the superiority of ecumenical councils over the Pope, at least in certain situations. So in Wikipedia, it says the council issued the, the, the significant decrees. Is, is there some nuance to that, to the, to that, to that statement? But obviously, Wikipedia is not the source of, <laughs> of, 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 tech, of, of technical <laughs> theological language. So, it, that, I mean, that could be taken legitimately. Sure, it produced a document and in that sense issued it. But in the sense of actually promulgating it to the entire church, it did not issue it. So it depends on the use of the term issue. Uh, yeah, some people might see that on Wikipedia and think, oh, that was approved by a pope. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, right. the, uh, anything that contains the uh, any any mention of this false conciliarism, that, well, I, I was, forget, drop the adjective false conciliarism is by definition of a false doctrine. Uh, any doctrine, any document that contained the doctrine of conciliarism was cast aside, just forgotten about. And this is mm-hmm. not the only case of a council of something like this happening in a council. Uh, the the Council of Basel, fa- very famously under Pope Eugene the Fourth just went plain schismatic. Its first few sessions are good and contain approved documents. But after that, the the members of it broke with the Pope and decided to go off and do their own thing. And at that point, it just ceased to be a council in in any true sense. Uh, Anything it did, it just petered out after that, just fell apart uh, once they had broken from the obedience to the Pope. And so it all it all underscores the fact that the Pope is everything. Uh, <laughs> the, so much of the divine assistance to the church is carried out to the actions of the popes who are the vicars of Christ on earth. Uh, anybody who breaks with that uh, really sets himself straight on the road to hell, frankly. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, to go into schism is, 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 a, is a mortal sin and has so many detrimental effects on so many levels. It's most immediately, that person exits the Catholic Church and uh, puts himself in the state of sin. But there are plenty of other evil effects that flow from that as well. I'm breaking from the Catholic Church on even just on the natural level, many evil effects that flow from that. And that is, in fact, the very... Uh, the heart of the current situation in the church that is the heart of the current problem and the current, the heart of uh, the source of all divisions among those who sincerely desire to be Catholic today. That is the fact that there is no Pope to whom we can all listen. If there were one, we would all listen to him and that would be the end of it all. That would be the end of all controversies. Uh, (laughs) He would decide, the Pope would decide upon all of it and we would submit and that would be that. But the very fact that we find ourselves arguing amongst ourselves, those who sincerely desire to be Catholics argue amongst themselves on so many things is because there is no final voice of authority to go to. In the, in the current situation, yes, we do have thousands of years of, of magisterium and, and excellent documents to, to refer to, but we don't have anybody to apply all of that definitively to the current situation. And therein lies the the major scourge of our current predicament. 